Hey gang, I'm back here with another comic book interview. Max Dunbar and I have worked together for years on a variety of different projects, and he's always been an amazing collaborator. I was going to hold off on doing interviews with people I've worked with on various projects, but Max saw my other interviews and he really liked them. And the more we talked about, it, the more I realized that his career progression is really, really useful for people to see. If you want to break into comics or you want to build up a career in art, I think it's extremely helpful to see the dedication that Max has had to the craft and the long hours and the um, just the, the organized method that he took to work his way up in terms of his skills, in terms of his portfolio, his network, and everything else in between. So this interview was a ton of fun. Max is always amazing, and I know you're going to be really inspired by his artwork. Welcome, welcome, Max Dunbar. You know, it's funny doing a video like this because we probably talk uh, at least once a week already. Yeah. On yeah, this, is, this is way too formal. It's freaking me out already. <laughs> I'm like welcoming you. You're like, what, yeah. what is this strange We do experience? this all the time. Yeah. So originally when I was setting up these interviews, I thought I wasn't going to do a lot of work, like, like interviews with my own co-creators because I thought that might be a bit too indulgent. But then I also realized I've shown so much of your artwork as examples during some of my other videos and lessons that it feels unfair not to uh, talk to the man himself and, and kind of I go through this it. stuff. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. This is, uh, <laughs> I've watched a couple of the other videos and they're super awesome. So I hope this isn't the low point of the entire thing. <laughs> I think thing. it's going to be far from that. I, you know, yeah. what I want to do is, and you know this, just sort of demystify the process and talk about how these things come about and what, you know, your experiences are. And, and I haven't done interviews with artists yet. Uh, I've sort of jumped first? around. You're the first artist in the pool. So uh, you get to set the, the, the precedent here in terms of It'll be a low bar. <laughs> it's only up from here. This, this is very Max Dunbar, by the way, talking down about your work, which is hilarious because during this, I'm going to keep showing all this phenomenal stuff. Um, but before we get into your career and we get into the amazing projects that you've done and all that kind of stuff, and, and I think your strengths as an artist and, and talking about storytelling and all those things, let's roll it way back. I want to talk about you as a comic book fan or growing up right. reading comics. What are some of your early favorites or, you know, right from being a kid, what kind of titles jumped out at you? Yeah, well, my dad was a comic book fan when he was younger, so he had like a massive collection of Silver Age comic books, mm -hmm. mainly DC. Um, he had a ton of Mad magazines, uh, like so Superman was this guy, so he had like a bunch of the action comics. Do you remember uh, so any I... particular, like what era we're talking about? You're saying Silver Age, so. Yeah, I mean, like I got to imagine it was like the 60s now. I did not pay close attention at that time whatsoever to writers sure. or artists i no, didn't no, of course not even understand that was a thing to pay attention to so i unfortunately like i'd have to go back and look at them um to find out the art was always amazing looking to me um sure. it was a lot of like you know those superman stories where it was like red kryptonite came yep. in a lot and it would always do something crazy something and that was like yeah, yeah, yeah. the catalyst for the entire story um there was, you know, some Batman in there, but Superman was the big one for DC. And then he had some X-Men comics. Nice. Um, I think he had like X-Men number three, like oh, really so early like, yeah, yeah. titles uh, nice. or early issues rather. Um, I think he has like Hulk number four, like the Incredible Hulk. Cool. Um, so I read and a so lot of And so you read those openly. You just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like this stuff was being kept safe and yeah, yeah, yeah. It should have been. Well, but it no should have been. At the but, time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I unfortunately, you know, being a little kid, I was not gentle with those. And I, I cringe to think at the damage I've done to so <laughs> many amazing comics. But yeah, so that was a big chunk of it. And then like outside of that, um, just as a as a young kid, like reading Tintin mm -hmm. was really big and Asterix and Oblix, you know, those nice. types of Do you things. remember any particular books that uh, from the series that jump out or or? Um, like for Tintin, um, mm -hmm. yeah, like Secret of the Unicorn, I think was like the cool. first one that I uh, read. So that one was always like really cool, especially because it had some uh, some heavy like flashback stuff, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, to want like pirates and, and whatnot. But you know, like the art is just so good in those. The storytelling is so clean, incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's just like the backgrounds are so detailed and 
the whole thing you just their their artwork like truly artwork um so those were like kind of the even before i was a comic book fan i mm-hmm. would say those were the comics that i was reading a lot of before right, right. i became sort of like a collector myself okay. so what yeah. did you start collecting then what started to jump out at you at, at yeah that time? so it's older. it's like really um clear in my mind when that switch happened it was i was at a bowling alley and i was playing the x-men <laughs> arcade game you know the one where yes. like you team up as like nightcrawler wolverine you got the four Colossus. player yeah, yeah yeah it was like mind-blowing to me because i i wasn't big into video games as a kid because i never had a system and just seeing these characters like i wanted to know more about them like and i guess that speaks to like just great character design where they're mm-hmm. all like so distinctive and they all had you know their power sets you know like i don't know who nightcrawler is but he's the coolest looking guy so <laughs> i sort of went like hunting at a comic book store and i knew the Mm x-men um so yes that i think pretty much got me into um like the the reprint trade of giant sized x-men number one because those were the same cast of characters Mm -hmm. and then ultimately like jim lee's stuff um, oh really so he was the he was the current artist at the time even yeah i believe so now my dates are going to be all a little bit vague because again like i wasn't like back issues were a big thing for me and i didn't really understand the concept of like these came out monthly and their artists to follow so i'd be buying up stuff random comics i didn't really understand so like jim lee on uncanny or was this the just x-men without a um... like the the x-men number one was probably the one that like that was sort of the turning point for me where i was like this is amazing and it's available Ooh. everywhere because there was so available many everywhere yeah, yeah. yeah and then like i think that's the one where i noticed like oh like this is the guy that's drawing in the exact style that i love and i mm-hmm. think his art was used on that game cabinet so that might be um, right yeah yeah i think like wolverine was definitely and maybe colossus so i was like i recognize this i recognize this style and that was really exciting to me and i had grown up reading all these sort of you know like retro or a bit old fashioned um Mm -hmm. and so the art styles and then going from like that very clean like great anatomy great storytelling but then going into this like super dynamic like Mm -hmm. crazy camera angles art style of jim lee uh just blew my mind and i was like i think in grade two at the time and i took it like to show and tell and like showed everyone wore the cover off of it like just by reading it so many times so yeah that was when i i think that's what set me on my path of loving comic books like and, and loving the art in particular right, right. and yeah. so in school you were drawing all the time this was something that yes. you wanted to do yeah yeah just non-stop like my uh parents were super encouraging of drawing and they didn't want me to really be watching tv all the time so that was really restricted so it was a lot of reading and a lot of drawing in my spare yes. time. And then like at school, I would just like draw on everything right. all the time, constantly. I'm sure my teachers hated it because um, <laughs> I didn't really do anything else. Um, but yeah, no, I knew from a super early age at that point that I wanted to be drawing like for a living if I could figure out how to do that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that transitioned ultimately into wanting to work in comics from a right. pretty young age. Yeah. from a pretty young age and so did you go to school for like post-secondary after high school you went for art or yeah well that was kind of interesting because in high school the comic book thing fell off a little bit okay. and um i've talked to other people about this and it seems like a lot of people go through like you know they go away from comics and then they come back yeah and so um high school i was more into video games like computer games and and playstation and stuff and where I live, Vancouver, is like such a gaming development hub, mm-hmm. uh, especially in Canada. Um, so I really wanted to get into video game art. Like I thought that, you know, concept art sounded amazing to me. Right. I actually didn't think that comic books would be like a practical career because back then I kind of thought that, oh, you have to live in the U.S. Like, right. you know, all, all the people that I knew of lived in the U.S. Sure. Um, so I was like, game art, I'll get to draw all day. I'll get to come up with, you know, characters and draw them. And 
that's what being a game artist is. So I went to uh, the Art Institute um, when that was still around. I don't know if they exist anymore, but uh, they had a campus just outside of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And I went there for two years to do game art and design. Okay. So, yeah. So did that involve, I mean, because that's uh, for video games, were you doing... Mm -hmm. Uh, concept art, but were you also doing like 3D modeling and yeah. things like that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, one of those things where like it started off great. Like concept art was like first term, mm -hmm. um, color theory, like all these sort of fundamentals. And the teachers were great and the classes were really good. We did life drawing and stuff like that. But then for the rest of the terms, it really switched into like, you know, uh, 3D modeling. Right, and digital um, production. And... Yeah, and this was before like 3D sculpting was really hitting it big. So right. it was way more technical mm -hmm. than artistic, at least to the way that I looked at it. Some sure. people were doing incredible artistic stuff with the but 3D you, modeling. It was frustrating to you then? Yeah, like it was kind of feeling like drawing with your left hand, you know, or like right. relearning a skill set that you would never really consciously learned and mm -hmm. then so now it's like this whole new thing that I have to learn and I just wanted to draw and I eventually became okay at it um but it definitely wasn't my passion like right. it definitely um so that kind of soured you on the idea of working in games or yeah like I was excited at the concept of working in games but like I think you know like any creative career you have to be gung-ho like a hundred percent in Mm -hmm. You can't kind of like half-ass it, you know, in your portfolio or your like interviews, stuff like that, your art tests. Um, mm -hmm. So like I got an a interview or two at companies after I graduated and they'd send me like an art test to do at home. Um, but like I did exactly what the minimum was. I didn't right. really like, I didn't push 3D anything. modeling thing wasn't yeah ultimately it wasn't for me um right and i just yeah was not successful in that arena whatsoever like so I, I where where did that transition happen was at this time were you getting back into comics or was there some other impetus yeah well like throughout my entire post-secondary i got really back into comics so there was a comic shop near the school um and i was just reading like i think new avengers was like launching then so i was like following a title which artist um, is on that well i think it started with david finch who okay. like amazing um lenny Liu, i think took mm -hmm. over and again amazing like just again my mind was being blown all over again by what was being achieved um in the art form and i just was super inspired and so it's kind of funny like i, I sort of did the reverse as I did in high school, like I went up on video games, down on comics, and it kind of right. happened in reverse when I was studying um, to become a game artist of some kind. So yeah, the idea of doing comic books, like kind of started bubbling back up in my mind a little bit, mm -hmm. absolutely at that time. So what was the, when did you start sort of putting out samples or did you put up a portfolio site or what were you working on to sort of make that a reality? Yeah, well, that's kind of interesting, too, because I was treading water there for a couple mm -hmm. years after I, you know, the gaming thing wasn't really working out. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of lost all momentum coming out of the, the school because I had some for a while, you know, you come out as a new graduate and then sure. like you go to a couple of interviews and those don't work out. And then like I worked for a gaming company, a very small like, garage gaming company, um, but like they paid me uh, and then that sort of folded. Mm -hmm. And then like the guy that I worked with there was like, oh, you know, you like drawing, I'm interested in doing a comic. And so we started working on that. And then that kind of folded. And I just really didn't have any direction after that. So I worked, you know, in retail for uh, just a couple of years to support myself. But the big switch happened when I moved out of Vancouver. Um, my then girlfriend, now wife, was going to school just outside of Vancouver, about three hours away. Mm -hmm. and I got a job in this new town, you know, working at Best Buy, and was essentially like, I have to do something, like, right. I've got, there, I don't know anyone in this town, um, I have nowhere to go after work, she's super busy with, like, studying, and so this is, like, the perfect time for me to, to just like, pour yourself into, yeah, 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 exactly, so it became, like, I busted out some anatomy books, um, you know, I already had, like, decent 
enough fundamentals to at least get the ball rolling, but I had right. a ton to learn. Uh, so it became like a second job. You know, I remember reading a Jim Lee article or interview somewhere where he talked about like, it becomes a job breaking into comics. Right. Um, right. So I felt just, I, I was going to do that. I was going to just this entire time we were in this town where I, I just come home after work and I would put in another, you know, six hours or so, like just at the table, um, studying anatomy, like, you know, just doing sequential work, um, figuring out perspective, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so yeah. That, so you're really like filling important. sketchbooks and doing, yep. doing pages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember just to get like a, like just some sort of grasp on the concepts of perspective. I just draw like cubes from different angles, mm -hmm. like pages and pages, stuff like that. Um, yeah, Bridgman, like Bridgman's uh, anatomy books, like how to draw books really um, gelled with me because okay. I just love this sort of like dynamic anatomy. It's always interesting to hear which kind of tutorial books really grab people because yeah. sometimes it's one or the other, you know, or it's yeah. like- Well, how to draw yeah. comics the Marvel way is like the go-to classic. Sure. That's the one that, I mean, I love that one too. Um, Drawing Dynamic Comics, I think is the name of another one that Andy Smith- did mm -hmm. that had some like between those two i feel like you can fill all the gaps like that cool. kind of has everything you need and then what um, artists were inspiring you at the time beyond someone like david finch or Leno you yeah so like sort of in when i was really into comics in elementary school like it was all the image guys mm -hmm. like the guys that eventually became image um tom mcfarlane like Greg Capullo, mm -hmm. uh, even I know he wasn't like an image guy, but like the or he became one, but like his uh, X Force stuff. Mm -hmm. um, J. Scott Campbell, uh, Joe Mad, like all of those guys. Sort and of. And I see those elements in your work. Yeah, you know, little little isms, like bits and pieces. There's a lot of Capullo. There's a lot of J. Scott. Yeah. But what's nice is seeing you gain confidence you know over the years yeah. and make them your own and find your own yeah. ways through them yeah. yeah yeah i think i mean i know definitely with me it's like you start copying is too strong a word but you learn how to draw sure. like through how like techniques that they yeah. have mastered Absolutely. and then you eventually find your own way um so yeah those guys like stuck with me i kept going back like any new projects that they mm -hmm. would announce i would go with um yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of people whose work i love but um i would say those guys and the guinness like i love his stuff sure. um I mean, there's, there's almost too many that it's like overwhelming my mind, but uh, right. those, yeah, those guys. Um, yeah. Cause I think around that time, like leading up to my first convention that I went to Greg Capullo was just starting Batman. Okay. Um, so that was like a huge deal for me. So yeah. Mm. Oh, Haunt. I remember when Haunt came nice. out. Ryan Otley was also a huge uh, person to me. Um, and he was someone like I was, you know, you go to all the forums and stuff. I don't know if they sure. still exist, but like that was sort of what the internet was at that point for artists was a lot of like forums and Ryan Otley was on the forums and he was someone that like made it. He was like, right. you know, an artist that went from the forums posting incredible artwork. And then like, he was now Breaking a comic through. book pro. Yeah. yeah so yeah um yeah his stuff was incredible and yeah just those guys like really pushed me to push myself and the mindset I had was like if I keep at this it's just a matter of time like right. I don't care how long it takes I will just do this you know I'll keep working like my day job but I'll right. keep doing this until I break in and your girlfriend was supportive and you know totally yeah, yeah. well like she was um you know studying to become you know a vet technician like it's a really hard thing to do so she was studying all the time and we were both just in this transition period where we mm -hmm. had come out of you know she was doing one job that she didn't care for and wanted to do right. something else and I was essentially like 
a little bit directionless, but then found a direction. And, and this was an obsession that. that, you know, it, it, you had a clear focal point for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And I was like working really hard at it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, presumably she saw that and like saw that right. I was pouring myself into it. So that had to be, you know, so how sure long is that was. exploration period through to starting to go to conventions or assembling a formal kind of portfolio, if you want to call it? Yeah. That? Um, so I want to say it, it was like months, not years. Um, I'll round it up to like six months, basically, okay. of just like working really hard. Almost day in, day out. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, I think when we lived there, we only went out because we also didn't have much money. So I was working sure. at Best Buy and she was a student. So we didn't like go out that much. We didn't right. socialize with other people that much. So I, it was like a lot, like when I say a week, it was probably seven days a week, you know, working right. at it. Um, and at that age, you know, that wasn't an issue for me. Right. Like, I was just right. re really motivated. So yeah, then um, sort of found through various like, you know, online interviews or articles, like what to do for a portfolio. I didn't stumble across your site at that oh, time. No I worries. don't know if, I mean, it had to have, you were. What year are we started? talking now? I mean, 2012 would have been when I. So, so 2012 was actually it. when I started posting articles, like blog posts about yeah. how to break in or how to find cool. an artist. But, okay. but those were you know, like they got a little bit of traction, but I didn't really, I think it was probably about a year, year and a half later when right. people were like, the pitching series was the, the article that kind of really went wide because like, you know, how to, how to break in is such, as much as the advice in there, I think is good. It's all pretty straightforward. Right. The pitch article was the one where it's like, oh, I haven't seen this before as much from people or people don't right. generally show this element of the process. So, yeah. 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 Okay. That makes sense then. Cause I was like scouring the internet for any sort of information I could get on, you know, how to break in. Right. Um, and around that time, uh, Mark Miller had started his magazine mm -hmm. that I, I don't know how many issues it ran for, but it had, um, and I was a fan of his. I think Kick-Ass was like coming out right around that time, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but he had a thing in his magazine where it was like, you write, you know, a short story and I'll publish it in my magazine. Like, you know, just anyone could do it. So I was like, I, I should try this. So I right. wrote a short story. Uh, it is terrible and super <laughs> simple. But the one thing that was good about it is it had like, um, you know, quiet at the beginning and then some action happened and there were environment changes, stuff like that. Um, and that actually made a pretty decent portfolio piece because it showed, you know, a six page story right. um, with a beginning, middle and end of some kind and set changes and some acting for the characters some action some quiet moments stuff like that and i knew that that is what editors ultimately wanted to see yeah that variety so, yeah the variety to show that you can handle sort of anything that comes through a script um so i did that nothing ever happened with it in terms of the magazine i have no sure. idea of anyone but you still had the off. pages but i had the pages yeah so um yeah, then I decided that I was going to try a convention because I guess I read somewhere that you have to go to conventions to break in. So right. Emerald City Comic Con 2012 was my first convention, first convention that I ever went to. Yeah. Oh, man. I guess I skipped the local ones. Like there, there were ones in Van <laughs> like small ones in Vancouver, but I was sure. like, I'm going to go to, you know, one of the bigger Seattle. ones. Nice. Yeah, Seattle. And, uh, you know, not too far. It's like a, right. I don't know few hours drive. I think did you like get a hotel drive. did you crash on someone's couch yeah, like... me, so me and my buddy um he's a comic book fan uh we grew up together he always was like going to comic book shops with me he wanted to go he had never right. been to a comic book convention so we drove down together we stayed in what might be the worst hotel in downtown <laughs> seattle i don't remember the name and I wouldn't say it, but it was uh, we got the full experience it was <laughs> terrible um Amazing. But yeah, so we went there. Um, 
and then yeah just did the did the convention did the tour um, and showed pages around yeah yeah did the lineup because they had like the the editor table and you just line up and mm -hmm. with your portfolio and talking to everyone else in line super nervously sure and then i think i saw at least two maybe three editors okay. uh in that weekend and mm -hmm. just showed them my stuff i i had that story i did um like a five page superman story that i just made up like okay. the the script again sort of that formula i'm gonna ask you for scans of all these yeah by the way, so I'm i'll gonna show, show you them. the one i need if to I see them find all. it yeah, if yeah. i can find it i'll show you the one that got me my first work uh sure. for sure because i think i kept that somewhere um because the the superman one like th this actually goes to show like the the sort of build of your portfolio mm -hmm. um it matters like in turn you know you get these guys that have been looking at thousands of portfolios all day so i put my strongest work at the very beginning sure and then had my you know weakest work um i thought it was you know i was like this is my best work all of it but right, like right, this right. is the stuff i'm most confident in and yeah so um the first editor i saw i can't even remember who it was um but he essentially said like this has some potential if you stick with it i think you'll be working in comics but like right. you're one or two years away right just super encouraging to me like i thought that was awesome nice. um i definitely didn't go in expecting to for anyone to like fall in love with my art or, or to get a job offer or anything like that um but then uh joe rybent who uh, the editor at Dynamite, um, he liked the sample pages that I did for the Mark Millar magazine mm -hmm. um, enough that he's like, here's my card, you know, uh, send me these again when you get back home. Nice. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk from there, like very right. vague and non-committal. Non yeah, yeah. Exactly. But uh, definitely encouraging. But it was a card so, from an editor. You're like, absolutely, well, there you go, yeah, it right? was huge. It was super sure. exciting to me. Um, but I think I've always done a pretty good job of managing my expectations and being relatively realistic. Um, so I wasn't expecting a lot, but I definitely, yeah, definitely was going to follow up with him. And I, mm -hmm. I believe that's the convention where I first met you because it might be. Yeah, so this probably uh, more memorable to me than you because okay. yeah, you would have been like a sea of random people coming up to me, but I went and saw a panel, like a small panel that you did about creator own comics. That might have been Charles Soul and I because we were doing those panels pretty regularly. Yeah, yeah. So I went to it because I was going to all the panels. Like the whole right. thing to me was like a huge learning experience. Sure, sure. Um, I wasn't there to. See, the first like, samples I remember seeing of yours, I think yeah. were Red Sonia ones. Yeah. Right. So, so I don't know was, what convention that was at. Or was that a that year would have been or... That would have been later because I... Yeah. Um, That's the first time that your stuff like made an impression, impression on me. Like I, those first samples, I don't, I don't remember at all. Maybe if you yeah, don't show me. them to me, I'll be yeah. like, oh my God. I, I yeah. doubt it. I doubt <laughs> it. They're, they're not, uh, they're not memorable. Like they're, right. you know, they're the bare minimum at what you'd need to catch the attention of an editor, I guess, right. you know, right. on a good day, like if you're right. lucky. <laughs> um, but that was a situation where like, I came up to you right. after the panel back at your table and just said, you know, great panel, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was a point of contact. Like you right, were someone right. in the industry um, and I met quite a few people that sure. uh, weekend, um, but, you know, I, I then found your site, I think, those uh, first articles that you had um, written uh, later after mm -hmm. the convention. And then I think I, I reached out or something at some point just, you know, because you looked at my portfolio at the uh, convention and I just like a thank you, something like that. Right. And then that, I guess, got the ball rolling ultimately to get me to show you my Red Sonia samples. And the Red Sonia stuff is because when I got back from 
uh, Emerald City, I did follow up with the editor and thanked yeah. him for, you know, looking at my stuff and, and resent the samples as he had requested. Um, and then he, Joe, Joe's a, a funny guy because like he's, and I don't know him that well, but super right. nice guy, but like very like, it was my first experience with a direct comic book editor. Like sure. there was no padding on those emails. It was like, he sent me, um, I think like right off the bat, he was just like, yeah, do you want to like try out for um, a book that we're, you know, releasing soon um and i was like yes of course and i was like elated and thought this was you know my shot sure and i uh, i did the samples and there was like definitely you know like a double page spread with this amazing action sequence in the script and i was like no no that's no good and i threw it away and i redid it and, you know spent like a huge amount of time on it and i sent it in and like yeah it got rejected he was just like yeah this is not this isn't gonna cut it right and i was like I've, I've lost it. I've, this is my one <laughs> shot and I've ruined it. Right. Uh, so that was pretty rough. Um, <laughs> but then he was like, can you draw a turnaround like sketch of Red Sonia without any sort of reason why or right. anything beyond that? So I was like, sure. And I did it and I sent it in. And uh, then he just sent a script for the issue one. And I was like, which issue what... is this? Uh, so that would be Atlantis Rises. It was a mm -hmm. four, I think a four issue mini series. Um, I was like, I have no idea what this means. So I had to <laughs> email him back and be like, uh, what <laughs> is hard? happening? Yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. like, yeah, you, you've got the job. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, it was pretty mind blowing. A little bit anticlimactic when you have to like ask what's going on, and then they're like, "Yeah, you have a job," because you go through. I was very I mean, it's confused. A, it's a at the sign time. of you as a professional that he's not not uh, uh, giving you any sort of intro. He's just like, "Yep, yeah, start there, working." There was no like fireworks or like yeah. you've made it or anything like that. It was like, <laughs> okay, like now welcome I have to, to the grind, out. kid. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was very much like I now have to figure this out. So. The next day I put in my two weeks notice at uh, Best Buy and that next two weeks was absolutely brutal because I was working you're trying to do as, a page a day. Yeah. And, and I'm working full time. Oh. Yeah. There was one point where I worked 24 hours straight, half of that in retail, half of that in comics, like, like wake up go to retail, come home, work all night on the comic, then go to retail again without sleeping. No. It was, it sucked. But, <laughs> you know, it's good because like now I look back at it and like, you know, 14 hour day or whatever. I'm like, yeah, but I could be doing that again. So right. it's, all, it's so, all good. So you do a four issue miniseries right from the hop. Yeah. And yeah. you hit your deadlines. Yeah. No, like he actually Ooh. told me to slow down a little bit because I was, <laughs> I was doing pencils only at that point. Okay, someone else was inking? No inks, just straight to colors. Okay. So that was my first few books were like that, just raw pencils, wow. straight to colors. Um, I didn't, like, growing up and being a fan of comics, I understood comics to be, like, penciler is a very separate job than inker. Right. And obviously those lines now have blurred somewhat. Sure. Even though people who are inkers, like they will ink better than I could, you know, in my wildest dreams. I they're think like, your inks are just fine, Max. But... Well, they're just fine. <laughs> but these people's inks are like sure. mind blowing, like right, beautiful. Right. So, you know, but at the time I didn't like inking was not even in my uh, mind at that mm -hmm. point. It was purely um, penciling. Right. So that's what I had practiced that I had not practiced inking whatsoever um so yeah it was just raw pencils in red sonia i tried to keep them as clean as possible sure and uh the colors you know uh helped but um yeah it it was uh it was a real learning experience for me so it was awesome. four issues four months or was it did you have like more weeks than like that's four a weeks good before? question um deadlines i understood the page a day concept and i think he might have given me a rough deadline 
Right. But like, I don't think it ever really came up as a problem. Well, so I never really, like, I just kind of held my own feet to the fire sure. and was just like, I need to get this done. I can't screw this up. I can't, sure. like, this is my foot finally in the yep. door. A and real I published don't wanna, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to uh, screw it up because I had heard the saying, you know, the only thing harder than breaking into comics, is getting your first in. thing in comics, yeah. is staying in comics. So I was like, now that I am in, I need to stay in, and right. I can't, I can't mess up my one opportunity. So yeah, I was, I was definitely was like disciplined about it for sure. So you did the four issue miniseries. Yep. And then what came next? So then. I don't know how much of a gap there was. I think there was a decent gap. Um, and then I got, uh, uh, with Dynamite Still, uh, The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. which was Fred Van Lente's like right. comedy. Parody of The Walking parody. Dead, yeah. Yeah, and like a very loose parody. It's its own story with like, there's no parallel characters or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's almost more like, um, almost like more like an Evil Dead type right. situation than The Walking Dead, but it was in um, black and white, like right. The Walking Dead comic. Um, I mean, grayscale. Um, but yeah, that so that was another. Um, and it was monthly. That was monthly, and I I want to say it was five issues. Okay. And I think it had like a low print run, um, but. I think it because The Walking Dead was like exploding at the time. Um, it did like pretty well. I think like right. like you know like it was like five printings of issue one or something. Oh, like, wow. but I think it was again like a low print run. I don't sure, know sure. actually what the runs were or what the numbers. So now were. you had you know two different series with very different feels to them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Because one was like so you know uh fantasy sword and sorcery yeah. sword and sorcery and then the other was just set in the modern day like current world and mm -hmm. so i got to draw like a good spread of stuff there um and one was comedy and so i got to like do a little bit more cartoonish stuff at times which i've always really liked um and then the other one was you know just very like straightforward um tonally like a you know very serious so nice. yeah it was like a fun mix and that sort of those two experiences really encompass like what I and that's 2012 2013 yeah probably that's not like 2012 definitely for Red Sonia I can't imagine there was like that long of a gap before Mocking mm -hmm. Dead so because this was the only job I had like right I, right but luckily uh, living where we were the cost of living was way lower than Vancouver so I was able to support myself um nice. on you know doing these sort of mini series for a smaller right, publisher. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was my first two. And then uh, there was a big, big gap after that. And yeah. that's when things got a little dicey in terms of the whole comic book thing in general. Yeah. You were doing, so what were you working on? Were you working on your own stuff or more samples or? Uh, so there was definitely, because the creator owned thing, um, Image Comics, like your Skull Kickers um, was like happening right mm -hmm. around then and getting a lot of exposure. And I was like um, paying a lot of attention to just what was happening in the industry at the time. Right. And Image Comics was having like their second, like renaissance, they were having like a renaissance basically. Oh yeah. When you look at like stuff like Chew or Morning Glories and yeah. you know, like there was a Rat Queens and just a bunch of series were seeing this kind of yeah. ramp up and in interest. It, yeah. That was really the post kind of Walking Dead boom of, well, what's the next big thing? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, and I knew nothing about the, the industry. Right. Like I knew nothing about I was, I was very tunnel visioned. It was like, I'm working on my book. I don't know how the industry works whatsoever outside right. of my own experience. Um, and I'm still learning. Like, it's still sure. like, just like figuring out the whole thing. Um, but I thought like, create your own. That's the, that's an amazing thing to do. So I was working on my own stuff. Um, you know, like various concepts that I had um, that weren't good but they were keeping me really busy. I remember you sending me one of them. So yeah, you definitely yeah I sent you one at one point. Yeah. 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 Um, got some good feedback on that for sure. 
Um, it was, you know, like I was interested in, oh man, like a whole bunch of things. So it was a lot of genre mixing stuff. Sure. Um, and yeah, but like, again, I, I tried inking my own work for the first time, I think right around then. And so good practice nice. um, was drawing just at all times, which I think is the most important thing. Of course. Um, to just keep drawing no matter what, because that's how you improve quickly. So yeah, was doing a lot of that. And then, um, yeah, after that, the dynamite stuff, it just didn't really have anything for me. Um, so I was kind of on my own trying to figure out how to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, I like, I think I signed up for like the comics experience website, which had like a good forum of yeah. professionals and stuff. And I had some samples like that. I was, I was still doing samples, like six page short stories that I would write myself and that I would submit and got a lot of encouraging feedback on it. People were like, this is good enough to be professional, which is good right. because I had ultimately, I guess, was a professional at that point, but I was sure. a professional struggling to get work. Yeah. Yeah. To get sure. regular work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so then I worked on some like kind of weird, like not, comic book industry comics where it'd be okay. like a video game company wants to produce like a, a video uh not huge video game company wants to produce like their own comic book series mm -hmm. so i think i did like like 100 pages like working Whoa. for like a comic book company and i think ultimately it went nowhere but they paid me and they were nice people good to work with and stuff but that like kept me afloat basically when I was looking for my next thing that I wanted to be on the shelf sure, like sure. um because you know ultimately if I can make a living drawing that's phenomenal right but there is something where it's like not being on the shelf um once well, you, you have been on yeah, the shelf. yeah you feel like you're yeah you no one's gonna remember you yeah, it's that momentum yeah. thing I guess where it's just I think like, all of I us feel it writers yeah. feel it artists feel it like you're like and I think the one of the weird transitions is if people are doing graphic novels and they're used to doing, say, monthly comics or something, and you yeah. go, so I'm going to go a year and no one's going to see anything. And you're just like, yes. oh, you kind of get paranoid. Yeah. Like, it's oh, weird. They're going to forget I exist. You're like, oh, it's not totally. not quite, but sure. Yeah. 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 The only good thing, like, in my mind about it was, like, I'm getting better. Sure. Like, that's, and that's the nice thing about drawing is, especially when you're drawing that amount and that early in your career, like, you i think the difference between like even issue to issue is noticeable sure. definitely series to series um and so you're like even if this stuff's not going to get seen by anyone i'm getting paid and i am improving so right. that's the silver lining to it for sure right. um so yeah i i did that for a while and um i think even after i got a notice from idw like they sent me an email and that i believe was your doing if i'm not mistaken like yeah, uh, the think, dungeons I, and dragons thing yeah so we were we were doing dungeons and dragons and we were casting yeah. for the artist on it yeah. and yours was i think there were like four artists that i showed right and yours stood out to them like it just it was a little bit thank more god. stylized <laughs> thank god right. it was yeah. just it, you know yours really stood out and had a nice quality and that designy element that i've always loved about your stuff where you weren't just drawing the basic story time particularly when it came to the the environments and stuff like that there right. was something that grabbed them yeah and so yeah you started uh on the D, D series with me so we did the legends of Baldur's gate Yep. which was this five issue mini series for IDW. It was right around yep. the launch of fifth edition D and D. So yes. there was all sorts of hype around new D and D and stuff like that. But which but, I was blind to, by the way. Oh, like sure. I had I mean, no idea about D and D. I knew of it, like wow, which is so weird to say now. Sure, but like, sure. And I loved uh, sword and sorcery stuff. I love medieval fantasy, um, and I was drawing a lot of it at the time. And I think you know some of the pieces that i did like posted on my deviant art for instance right. or like twitter um i think those were the pieces that you probably showed the folks at yeah. iw yeah which like if i could hammer any point home to anyone that's looking to break into comics is like post your art in a non-obtrusive way mm -hmm. 
as much as you can in right. every space that you can find because you just never know like this situation is such a coin flip like you were asked to show them four people right like you found a piece of art i did and posted maybe on deviant art and then that was like maybe the thing that pushed it in my favor. Yeah, and like sometimes just, you get that formal portfolio presentation, but a lot of times it's just like a bookmark someone's got online and they go, oh yeah, yeah that person did an awesome version of something yeah. in that vein or wouldn't yeah. that be cool to see? Or, you know, you throw it in the pool. You just don't know what's going to be the one that's going to break through, totally. right? Totally. And you, you busted out that series in good order. And what was amazing to me was we were... You know, Baldur's Gate is an established video game franchise and D&D is obviously established in all these different ways, but you were not afraid of also just designing stuff, which is, I'll be honest, unusual. A lot of comic <laughs> artists, they just sort of, okay, give me the reference and I'll draw exactly what I'm told. And you were it like, it might have oh, been ignorance. Like, it might have been ignorance at that point. It's a like, hell of a strength, man, because you were like, oh, this is the reference. Oh, I'm going to take it further. I'm going to like build this stuff out or, or do samples. And you did yeah. like a horde of sketches for that yeah, first a lot. series. And they became like a real, um, a calling card for you, I think, because everyone at, at like IDW was blown away by it. I was blown away by it and super excited to see you do that stuff. And then eventually that stuff would work its way all the way to Wizards of the Coast. And they were, you know, so impressed that it, it became a concept art job for you down the line. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's crazy. Like, I would say my career as it is now is got like sort of two beginnings that you can trace like every job that I've gotten back to. Right. One is the dynamite stuff, which yeah. splintered off and ultimately... I mean, they probably meshed together at some point again, but like that ultimately became like my connection with DC came through the dynamite stuff, I believe. Right. Um, and then this is like all of the D and D stuff and all the right. IDW stuff and, and the Marvel stuff so all came through this, right. but the design stuff is kind of funny that you mentioned that because through the entire time that I was working on that, I was also doing this other comic for this video game company and which mm -hmm. involved a ton of design work because right. i was essentially world building this crazy setting that they had come up with like they had just literally it was, was like you design the world from the ground up wow and so it was like reference gathering in a way i'd never done before it was concept sketches and they're video game people so they like concept sketches sure so they would like give like they just ask for tons of concepts so i think that sort of drilled into my mind like if I'm going to draw like an area, like in Baldur's Gate, uh, you know, a lot of it took place in like lower city or the lower mm -hmm. part of Baldur's Gate, like the slums. I was like, I should figure out what that means to me. So like I right. drew a bunch of pictures after gathering a bunch of reference and like the wide, like I knew we had a big scene, like in that market. So I drew the market and, and I thought that that was kind of like standard, or I thought that that would be like, it's, it's generally normal. not. And what's amazing yeah. is not only do you know, so some people will, will do character designs or they'll do costume designs and that's sort of like, oh, I get to design the new costume of whatever superhero. Right. Location design is something most people like run away screaming from and you right. lean into, which always surprises me. Uh, even yes. now, it's like something I love about your work. And when we started to, you know, the more we would collaborate, the more I would lean into that because I was like, oh, you love to do right. it and it looks awesome. And I think they're great show pieces because they give people a greater sense of atmosphere in a place instead of just here's a bunch of disparate characters you know right yeah for anyone that again looking to break in or looking to like make themselves stand out even a little bit i would say like environments mm -hmm. the backgrounds are the things that people tend to neglect the most and not just right. like you know depending on what you're drawing they'll call for different things but like you know if you're drawing two people talking in a diner and it's a portfolio piece. So you have a little bit of extra time, like maybe make that background, like look a little bit lived in, like what kind of right. diner are we talking about? Like put some story element into it. Um, and I think all of that came from a post, an amazing post that Mark Brooks did, okay. um, who I'm also a huge fan I of. Mean, and he was he's very, yeah, 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 very, uh, I don't even know if he's like an influence on my style, but like definitely I loved his work. And it was a huge inspiration to me. 
Um, but he made a post on DeviantArt years ago and it made a huge impression on me. And it was all about backgrounds. And I think it's still out there. And I recommend anyone who's interested in comic art read it. And it was a real light switch moment for me. It's like the background is a character. Like mm -hmm. if you're drawing the characters and you like drawing characters, but you don't like drawing backgrounds, you're depriving yourself of drawing another character. Like right. in most cases, there's a story to be told there in one way or another. And you don't have to like overdo it and make like a little weird, like background story happening really, but it will add to the story. It will. Yeah. You can, well, you and, and it's one of those elements that I feel like I can tell a professional portfolio when I see the backgrounds, like I, because people can emulate so much about the character stuff, like they, they yeah. can lean into a particular, their favorite artist and they can emulate it and figure out how to, draw faces like so-and-so or draw bodies or action or or even some of those quiet moments they can pull that off relatively well by oh. riffing on oh this is the way you do those expressions and this is a turn of the head and this is that stuff and they just yeah. like human photocopiers they'll figure that stuff out but the minute i look at the background all the all the veneer that they put on yeah. just falls away. I can instantly tell if they actually have a grounding in the basics, if they understand right. volume and proportion, if they understand staging, or if they've just been faking it and it's all frosting and no cake, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It's like the fundamentals, it's like the building yeah. blocks. Yeah. Because like obviously the perspective also like works with the characters. Absolutely. And, they, and that's why you can't fake it. Like it's yeah. so hard to fake the perspective stuff and it's so hard to yeah. fake the proportion. And so even if they've been able to figure out how to do cool anatomy or cool posing, it's like what's around the characters, oh, it's just gobble junk. Yeah. Like it, yeah. 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 And like you'll see those portfolios where you're like, you know, like this is pretty good. Then you'll see like a character that looks amazing. You're like, yeah. that looks suspiciously good like <laughs> i don't know where you good. i don't know where yes. like you're you lifting that from, from somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah like exactly. it looks but in the backgrounds you're like you know and it's 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 easy to neglect but you're like this this hurts the overall world oh big it's time and it, it's it's yeah. the alarm bell that goes off and you're yeah. like oh you can't actually do this. Not and then yet. it makes you look at everything else like that yeah, really great yeah. shot. You're like, well, if you couldn't do that, then are you, you really do this? Doing yeah. Bits and pieces and Frankenstein yeah. monstering your style from a bunch of totally. other stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And everyone does that when they're starting off to a oh, certain sure. degree, but the sooner you can nail down the and fundamentals like, yeah. and it's not like a, a, I've learned and now I'll do. It's like a constant, like you're constantly getting better. Right. But at some point I feel like you cross that line where it's like, okay, now like, I'm good enough at these things where right. people will notice that it's that much better than it was, right. you know, a couple months ago. So yeah. So you did, so you did uh, Dungeons and Dragons, yep. five issues, five issues of that. And my, my timeline might get a little fuzzy here, but Micronauts was definitely, um, well, something that IDW i jumped again. in which is also yeah. idw now no before micronauts before micronauts uh, was another big thing for me which was um yeah this, this very important chapter so um i, I believe it's molly mahan who worked at dynamite yeah then left dynamite to go work at vertigo right and she was on the mocking dead and so she knew my work and this is right. how the connections are made, like yep. and how jobs happen um, and how important it can be to like always do your, you know, your best. Make a because, good impression. And yeah. And like be timely and stuff because you never know, you know, not that you should be thinking about how people can aid me in any way, but you just never know what can sure. happen with people. So, and she had come up to me at a convention. So uh, the talked. funny connection thing, I'll just roll that yeah. back to, to another example, exactly what you're talking about. The editor on Legends of Baldur's Gate was yeah. John Barber. Right. John was someone I met in web comics and we both did web comic stuff. Right. And it's like, not that that, I, I ended up getting the D&D gig because Ted Adams really wanted me to do more stuff after Samurai Jack. Right. But like during Samurai Jack, frankly, but the fact that John was the editor and we already knew each other from comics hurt. years early just was like, oh, this is yeah. going to be so much smoother. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. So then the next big thing that happened for me was Molly took, I guess, my stuff over to Vertigo and mm -hmm. showed them. And that was 
the big um, launch that they were doing, that relaunch, right. it was like a huge number of titles, all number ones, like creator owned books, mm -hmm. and they were all going to launch like in rapid succession. Right. So um, I worked with uh, Cy Spencer and Andy Parks on um, uh, Slash and Burn, which was mm -hmm. like a it's it's a it's a bit of a strange concept and a, and a little outside my wheelhouse when it comes to like the stuff I've done before or after. But again, like a really cool challenge. Um, my first time getting my work inked by someone, Andy did an amazing job. And uh, but Vertigo, like a huge, right. prestigious, big step up, um, big step up. And um, not not to say IDW is anything to sneeze at, but no, like no, it was but... just you know legendary type books um, had you know come through Vertigo. Mm -hmm. And so that was like a, a real, um, you know, amazing moment for me. And it was going to be an ongoing uh, creator on like design everything like um, set in a, again, like a totally different place that like we we're going, I think for like a weird, like uh, Midwestern town, like, you know, mm -hmm. no taller than two story buildings. So it was just like a totally different aesthetic sense. And like one that, I probably wasn't, you know, if I'm being honest, I probably wasn't like the best fit for in the world, but like I tried my hardest and sure. I think it came out okay. But yeah, so that ended up getting canceled though. So we did six issues? issues on that. Six issues. Six okay. issues. Yeah. Um, and sort of the begin, like the start and finish of an arc. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think most of the new launches, uh, you know, it was like an ambitious project. There was like sure. so many new ones. And um, I think only like one or two made it past six. Um, but again, like, you know, that was great people I worked with. Right. Uh, got my foot well, in the Building door. up I, all those, you know, yeah. contacts and, and making a good impression on those folks. Yeah. Yeah. And also it was like IDW didn't have anything for me. So it's right. like after Dungeons and Dragons. So you're sort of like, lily pad jumping like yeah we to had a gap out. between those first two mini series of all, over a year i was sort yeah. of like okay we did it let's do more and they were like oh we're gonna wait and see how it does yeah. in trade and then by the time you see how it does in trade and then it's okay now we gotta yeah. start planning it took totally. a, it took a year and a half i think to get that second mini series off the ground and yeah. then from then on it just kept rolling but they got you back for yeah. covers on it but yeah yes which was yeah. great um but yeah so the vertigo got my foot in the door ultimately at dc mm -hmm. but that wouldn't come to fruition in any way for quite some time sure. down the road so then it was back to idw mm -hmm. because you know the contacts that i'd had there and like john barber right. um so you know, did I, micronauts I, micronauts and that's yep. actually to date the longest run i've ever had on a comic Oh, really? Um, yeah, because I believe the way it worked is they, I want to get this right, but I think there was some sort of drastic change or emergency that happened. They had started issue one with a different artist and they, something had happened. I, I'm not sure what, some sort of conflict, sure. scheduling conflict. Um, I don't think it was any fault of the artist. And he just, he just couldn't complete the issue. And it was like right. solicited and everything like that. Um, and so they asked me and a few other people to can you come in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll just like Frankenstein this thing together. So I think I did five or six pages. And again, like did them, you know, as best I could in a, in a very tight deadline. Like sure. it was like, can you do six pages in like three days? Something Ooh. like that, something like crazy like that. That's rough. Uh, yeah, but I did it. And I think that made an impression on them. Sure. Um, for at least reliability. And then when, you know, I was done those, they're like, the artist can't come back. Do you mm -hmm. want to start as the, you know, artist on issue two? And I was like, absolutely. I would love to. This works out pretty perfectly for me because I have no other job. Although I might have been doing like other stuff as side gigs throughout this entire thing. Sure. Uh, like basically through the first good chunk of my career, I was working two comic book art jobs wow. at any given time. Uh, just like, so I, I think at that point it wasn't like the, 
I think the fear of, of a job ending and just it being like nothingness sure kept me like always wanting to have something Pushing. in my back pocket. So mm-hmm. yeah, I did like uh, a, a super good guy, like hired me to do his sort of a, like screenplay adaptation of um, a couple different stories that were really nice. long and he paid me really well for them. And it was just a good working relationship. So I had that going the entire time. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so really lucky to get those things, but it's just constantly putting yourself out there, putting your work out there. And then people start drifting to you and asking sure. if you can, not to say that you shouldn't be also seeking stuff, but no, no, why but not have got goals, your samples you know? out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you do yeah. slash and burn. Yeah. Then, and then micronauts. micronauts. Yeah. And, and micronauts, sh- how many issues? That was ultimately, I think, 12 issues. So I worked from two to 12. Um, and then it didn't get canceled. It just, they did like a big relaunch thing. Right. So it was all like new stuff. Um, but that's where I learned, learned, began to learn how to ink myself because, okay. uh, they didn't have the budget, I guess, for an inker. Right. Um, I had never, the only t- other time I had ever had inks on my work was slash and burn, but I was like, I like the way it looks having right. inks on my work. So you want to try to sort of figure so, it out. Yeah. yeah. So you can, it's a real, like. You open up issue two of Micronauts, so like, and then like it gets slightly better, you know, issue three, and I'm learning on the job, which is a really fortunate thing to be able to do because, you know, it takes a lot of practice to even get like sort of good at it. Right. And it's just been a constant ever since then. I've always inked my own work and it's just been progressing. Right. Growing. Progressing, progressing. Yeah. Like, and it's still like, still learning new stuff every single day. So, and, you know, searching out to find different techniques, how different artists do it. Sure. Yeah. And then you've done, you did an event book at IDW. Yes. And that remains the hardest thing I've ever done. Cause it was comics. like a little bit of everything. It was like Transformers yeah. and it GI Joe. Transformers, GI Joe, a little bit of micro. It was basically the Hasbro verse. Right. Um, event. And Fico Ozio had done the previous event. And just absolutely like crushed it, like did like mm-hmm. the most amazing, awe inspiring work. And then like <laughs> it was like Max, you ready to step up to the plate? You get the next event. And I was like, oh my god. And I, I can't say I did. Like I tried my hardest, but like it it does not look that great. Like it's. Hard I'm gonna be stuff. posting artwork while we're talking about this, and I know people are people just gonna, will see what I mean. They're gonna people. roll. No, they're gonna roll their eyes and be like, this looks amazing. No, it was, I had always said, like, I love drawing everything except Transformers. Like, <laughs> and I had never, I had never tried drawing Transformers right. before. It, it was a little bit before my time when I was a kid, like right. at least the, the cartoon, like the, the show. And the, I think the movie probably came out like kids my age loved it. But like, I just, I was never into cars as a kid either. Right. So like, just didn't gel with me. Um, and so I had never drawn them before, but I was like, that looks impossible. You're essentially drawing like these incredibly well-designed yet simple, yet complicated, like right. a lot of angles, a lot of perspective. Um, and you combine all that with like having to stay strictly on model like that, that seems impossible to me. It turns out it was, it was super, super <laughs> hard. It was, <laughs> really hard like i i like every single day i was just like how many transformers are on this page like 12 like this is gonna take me literally forever and uh yeah the gi joe stuff like that was always super fun right um but the transformer <laughs> stuff was like that was work for sure nice and especially after seeing what uh figo did beforehand where right. he made it look so effortless like it's like this organic sort of like flowing beautiful line work and i just i was like i'm not capturing that same magic with mine and it was it was just one of those things though that and that's comics though is like and i just kept telling myself that it's like you're not going to draw your favorite thing every time time. especially like especially when you're starting out uh and you are taking whatever books sure they give you um and it's not like i'm turning down a lot of books now but like it's it's like 
you know, do you want to do Micronauts? Like, yes. Yeah. Like, yes, I do. So I'll what, find out so, what Micronauts is <clears throat> after. Yeah. The pivot after that event, though, that's kind of, you did get traction after that. Like, I think that that's sort of where you start to do more. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what was point. after that event, though. Should have, like, like, printed out a timeline of my work. Um, because I honestly can't say what I did directly after that event. I want to say it was IDW again, because um, David Hedgecock was the editor on that. Mm -hmm. And he knew that like, we were under a fairly tight deadline for that as well. And he knew that like, just, I think, cause it was a lot of moving parts, you know, sure. there were multiple writers um, and it's just like big plans, you know, over multiple different books. Um, and so it was just like the deadlines like got really tight. Right. And yet I still delivered on them. Like at that mm. point, I hadn't ever missed a deadline. Like it was like right. a deadline. I will hit it no matter what. I will put myself through some horrible long <laughs> nights, but I will hit that deadline. So right. I think that made an impression, if nothing else did, on like David, who was like, you know, we really appreciate what you did on that. Sure. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like if we can, you'll always have like a project. Right, right at idw which was great that was like super amazing awesome to hear yeah um and i really appreciated it but for the life of me i can't remember what came after See, that. and i don't know which you did some dc short stories you did yep. a couple yep. issues of champions with me yes <clears throat> uh we might be getting up to that point it feels so long but then when you actually look at the number of things i've worked on it's actually not that many i think it's just because you know six issues that's like a half a year at the yeah. very least yeah, the right time there flies, so right? time flies i've been doing it for 10 years next year i guess okay, so nine so, years now yeah yeah so with you know some big gaps in the beginning right, so right. um and it's not like we have to go over every single uh book but yeah i think the next big one let's just say was gears of war would have been a big one that okay. was cool yeah because that was curtis weave Mm -hmm. and um asked me just sent me a text because we uh, i had tried out for rat queens okay. like the uh not the initial one uh, the uh, relaunch the yeah. relaunch i had tried out for that and i think i got pretty close and in fact it, um it was like i there was one point where i wasn't sure what was happening but it was like pull the trigger on slash and burn or wait to see what happens with rat queens and i pulled right. the trigger on slash and burn because it was an ongoing title sure, of Vertigo sure. and creator owned and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, Rat Queens is creator owned, but yeah, I yeah. would be, I would be building something from the ground up, exactly. which has always really appealed to me. So Curtis and I had stayed really friendly. Like uh, he's a Vancouver guy or was a Vancouver guy as well. Super nice. Mm. Um, and I loved Rat Queens, obviously. Um, so he sent me a text out of the blue one day. And I think I was probably winding down on, first strike or something else um and he was like hey like i'm doing a gears of war miniseries um mm -hmm. at idw i want to say yeah it was an idw book um do you want to do it again i was like yep yep i never played a gears of war game in my <laughs> life um i had i knew that i thought it looked cool right. when i went to game art and design school gears of war one was coming out right at some point i just didn't have like an xbox so sure. i never really got to play it um but i was like oh this is like big dudes with guns and they've like stubble it looks awesome so uh and it was it was super fun and um the the people at the coalition which were developing the gears of war game that will because i think it changed uh development studios if i'm not mm -hmm. mistaken super nice um and they they seemed to like the work i was doing and gave me enough leeway where I could like, you know, there were some new characters that we got to develop who have nice. since been included in like the Gears of War games, like the oh, multiplayer cool. and stuff. Oh, I gotta see the my concept mind. art. I gotta it's see the concept so art cool. for these like, as well. Um, so interestingly enough about the, the the concept art, like I think again, it was quite a uh, tight deadline. Um, so I think I designed like a lot of those guys on the page. Oh, wow. Um, which actually, if you look carefully at them, you can see them change quite rapidly from like <laughs> the, where they're first introduced to like later. But um, yeah, like there's a couple characters in particular 
that like one of them i mean is like straight up just an orc like he's what's just his like name? he doesn't uh, his, his name's srak okay he's like a locust um but he's like the like the big and this was a prequel to the first game so like um these are characters that don't ever show up in like the, the game because right. what's happened with them has already happened sure. except the main the main characters rise of rom so it's like right. the main antagonist in the first game we're learning some of his backstory so there's some people that he has to kill to get to like his high position i got to design those guys and nice. or some of them and um and so uh like one of them just turned out i think to be like a little bit of a fan favorite or at least a favorite of the developers they're like that guy's cool looking essentially like i gave him huge tusks which none of the other locusts really have um and like uh, i think curtis described him as a power armor so i designed that and then yeah they put him into the the multiplayer for like the new games cool. and it's just super cool to see like right. your work translated into anything else which is yeah, like yeah. why the the magic the gathering like cards with our D D characters is like it's so such a thrill yeah me. yeah it's just like anytime you see something that you designed um or in like you know came up with um and then seeing it like in something in some other format is is so cool it's just it feels like a real thing at that point i guess nice yeah it's a, and you've had steady stuff ever since like as far as i can yeah tell. yeah it's yeah been like, it's been once, steady. once you hit that first strike and then gears of war i like i it was when i would talk to you it was like trying to find a gap yeah 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 it's been steady but um it still felt like it could slip away at any moment sure which is interesting and i don't That's know the how... freelancer fear yeah i think it's yeah. like like i think that first gap of like after mocking dead and just like i'm unemployed and i literally don't know where my next paycheck's coming from but like i have you know the rent all that right. stuff like that was really scary to me and so that was something where i have always taken on too much work <laughs> more than i should do right. in order to make sure that hopefully doesn't there's never again. a gap right yeah yeah so yeah. If Are I you said, finally like, feeling that like solid ground now? Because when I look at your schedule and the stuff that you've been able to do over the last three years in particular, you know, you say mm -hmm. it's been nine years. I think the last three have been explosive for you in terms of both output and also quality and, and your ability, the confidence that I see on your pages, your ability to design at a really, really high level, environmental and character, your ability to tell the story on the page. There's a reason why I'm showing them as the examples in a lot of my tutorial videos, because to me, That's I very feel nice like, no, dude, you're doing it right. And you know, you, you, you're balancing storytelling and aesthetics, you know what I mean? That there's dynamics, right. there's good action, but just because you're doing dynamic stuff doesn't mean that storytelling doesn't matter or that the text doesn't right. matter you know you you've struck this really cool balance that i think shows well you know on all levels thank you first of all um i think like with my work in general it's it's always felt like um the energy has always been there which is good mm -hmm. because that's not something that everyone has like an easy time with like right. just having like energetic line work and stuff but it's like just like wrangling it and like like making it look cohesive or like not right. having like a face in one panel just like slide off the head completely <laughs> like it always feels like i'm just like tightening it up you know like just trying to figure sure. out how to like like you know i look back at old work and i'm like okay this one panel looks okay but then this one like it goes off the rails a little bit and like how can I try and fix that in the future? And so that's, it's been like, I mean, would you learning. look at, you look at the first D and D mini series and oh, God, you know, yeah. legends and you compare yeah. that to infernal tides. And yeah. It's like, first of all, you're doing pencils in the first one. And yeah. We're so it looks, over the it looks, um, it's very thin just, line. Very. Yeah. yeah. Fundamentally it doesn't look as strong. Right. Um, just because you're not because, dropping blacks or anything on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and like that, that type of thing, like spot blacks, like, all of that stuff um, came later, like uh, right, right. like learning how to be comfortable with like shadow. And uh, I feel like, at least with me, 
that's like something that like if you're learning a bunch of things that comes after even though it's mm-hmm. incredibly important it's like well first i have to learn how to draw like a, a body in, and right. then i have to learn how to draw it in motion and then i have right. to learn how to like draw clothing and drapery to some degree and then and it's like light it yeah. and now i have to learn how to light it because like you can leave a lot up to a uh, you know the colorist the colorist does so much for you already sure it's like they can light a lot of it too uh, there's people with very open line work and it looks mm-hmm. gorgeous on the completed page if you've got a good colorist they'll do a lot of that heavy lifting for you because obviously it's a huge art you know it's a it's a it's an art unto itself it's an incredible mm-hmm. discipline but it's like you know if you want the the line art to stand on its own as much as possible which ultimately hopefully looks better as it's colored Sure. lighting then becomes that much more important in my opinion i i so i this is something that i've been learning and right. continue to learn is lighting shadow all that stuff. and your current you know projects you've got lined up so you and i did stone start together at yes. comiXology which was a ton of I, fun we get to build so this much thing from the ground up yeah but now you're doing you did batman urban legends yes uh, and so you did uh, an outsider story yes so there was like a so uh David Wilgots at DC um, contacted me a while back when we were doing Stone Star, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, just super, like, super nice guy. Um, and was just like, I'd love to work with you at some point. And I think I had done maybe um, a couple short stories. Like, you did know, like anthologies. a Bizarro one, I think? Yeah, I, which is amazing because yeah. going back to my dad's old comics, Bizarro featured heavily in many nice. of them. So like that was so fun for me to, to do fun that character. Back. I've, yeah, lo- yeah. I've loved that character for my whole life. Um, but yeah, so uh, I did a couple uh, short things for them and they were always so nice at DC and being like, you know, we'll, we'll have to find something more for you to do, but mm-hmm. no sort of like super firm offers. Something sort of fell through at one point. So I, I feel like I was getting there, but I hadn't really like landed um, in any in any sort of solid book or anything. Um, and then Dave sent me an email and I was busy working on other stuff. So it was just like, believe me when I say I want to work with you. I just right. can't right now. Sure. And because uh, at that point, I think to to back to your point of like, I was working on stuff and I was busy. I was like very busy. I didn't want to take on more than I could chew. Right. And because I feel like um, if with some people uh, that get their, their break, like the big two super early, Mm -hmm. um, you just tell that they, they might, they might be like, not fully swinging for the fences on every panel or every page in a way that I wanted to. Right. When I got my chance to do, you know, these incredible characters at these incredible places. So I was like, believe me when I say that I, I want to work with you. I just want to give it my all. I don't want right, to, right, I don't right. want this to be a side Squeeze project. Squeeze it between other things. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so with Dave it finally worked out, I gave him some, some uh, lead time and at this point we had done the champions issues together which were Mm -hmm. super super fun well we got to play to our strengths we were both doing fantasy (laughs) stuff with the superheroes which was yeah it was amazing yeah and like the team working on that like nolan's colors one of of my favorite one of my favorite sequences is is there's a sword fight where i literally just said use as many or as few panels as you want and just make it cool which i love and and this character ends up dead at the end and it was which is all i need yeah. Which is like the nicest thing someone can do, in my <laughs> opinion. Maybe some artists don't like that, but like sure. one of the hardest things to do is detailed choreography, choreography. like yeah. that when it's very specifically written, especially if there's dialogue, which there wasn't in this sequence. Right. But like, because, you know, you want the read order to be proper and all that stuff. So like sure. if if you're like trying to figure out, well, how do I make this character do this or that character do this while remaining on the left part of the panel and the other characters on the right, it can get very complicated very quickly. So having an, uh, a writer just say like, look, like make it, you know, go back. I think you said something along the lines of like, you know, they both seem in trouble at one point right. maybe. And like, but then otherwise go for it. And I was able to like, you know, I, 
have a lot of fun and do a pretty coherent fight sequence because I was able to figure out how many panels I wanted right. and really do it exactly the way that I wanted. So if it doesn't work, it's a hundred percent on me. But like, <laughs> If it does work, then like, you know, it's because I got to do exactly what I wanted right. to do. And we so, did that a couple of times in Stone Star, yeah. I think because of that. That was like a yeah. lesson for me is like, oh, this guy, like, let him let him loose. You know, this yeah. is fun. Which is like um, something that I would encourage more writers to do uh, when they can. I know sure. that it's not always viable, but um, I always really appreciate it when like, you know, the, the reins are taken off a little bit because, you know, as an artist, I feel like your job is to, you know, you're taking a big chunk of the storytelling yourself. It's not mm-hmm. just the writer doing that. So oh, massive. Any point, yeah, yeah. A, a massive part of the storytelling. So anytime where you can be like, let me figure out what works best visually, as mm-hmm. long as it doesn't harm what you were going for in your script. Right, right. And together we can like cross the finish line on this page and get something where it's like both of us getting to flex our muscles in the way, you know, in the disciplines that we're best at. Right. And I think that those are like the most fun to work on for sure. And then I think they come out the best. So sweet, yeah. man. That's a pretty good note, actually, to kind of kind of wrap things up. I think we've, yeah. we've covered some really good ground. When you think about your growth as a storyteller, you know, and the sheer volume of stuff you've drawn. So now you're doing, you're doing this Batman Beyond story for Batman or or Urban Legends, right? Yep. You're doing concept work for Wizards of the Coast. You're doing these character designs every couple months in Dragon Plus. Yep. uh, Yep. Which is a ton of fun. You've been doing a lot of just like covers and illustrations and all sorts of amazing funky things. Like when you look at your progression as an artist, when you see how far you've come, I know it's hard to put a button sure. on it because you're still yeah. growing and you're still figuring this stuff out. Yep. What is, what do you wish you'd learned sooner? What do you wish you'd told yourself, yeah. you know, you could tell yourself at the start or some kind of piece of advice that you think could, could help someone else? That's a really good question. I would say, Ultimately, the earlier you can dive into sequential art, mm-hmm. the better, um, yeah. because so much of it is muscle memory. So much of it is just repetition. Um, so get drawing, away from pinups, get away from, you know, just yeah. character designs and standing yeah. poses. and Exactly. And um, the ultimately, like, if you feel hamstrung by the fact that like, oh, there's no good sample scripts out there, or I can't find like just write your own. Like you're doing this for yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have dialogue in it. Like I, I wrote scripts where it was like two people walking down the street. Right. Uh, they see someone, uh, they chase them. They then chase them into an alley and up onto a rooftop. And then someone in a helicopter comes along and like shoots at them. And that way you're getting like, you're getting a quiet moment, you're getting action, you're getting different angles on buildings and vehicles right. and all that. And like the point should be to push yourself as hard as you can. You should go into it being like, I don't know how to draw any of that. Let me figure it out as I go. Right. And Rather than then, trying to avoid. Yeah. Those don't don't yeah. play to your strengths. If you think you have any at the beginning, um, because we're all, you know, we all have things we're comfortable drawing. Sure. You're like, what am I weakest at? And how can I twist the knife and make it like, oh, this is like way harder than it should be. But like, I'll, I'll sweat through it. Like, let I'll me come through the hours. other side yeah. stronger. Yeah, absolutely. So I think awesome. that would be my advice to anyone, you know, do it's like, you know, exercise, you have to exercise the, your, you know, your drawing ability for sure. Yeah. And the muscles that hurt are the ones yeah. that need it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice, man. Well, um, you know, it's always been a pleasure to work with you. It's a joy. Yeah, man. And I'm so excited to see what you've got in the hopper. I'm always pleased to to be a part of it. And when I'm yeah. not, you know, just slightly jealous of of the other people that get to get to, you know, collaborate with you and, and build brilliance. So well, well, likewise, hundred percent. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have some stuff that yeah, will man. be but you've got you've got so much cool stuff. Batman Beyond looks amazing. I'm really, Thanks. really proud of you. Thank you. And, I'm uh, excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing. So thanks so much, man. No problem. The next time we talk, it'll be much even even more casual. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. <laughs>